Hello again and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 11 and it is entitled Work, Energy, and Power. I would suggest to you that the concepts of work and energy and power occupy the central place in all branches of physics. Whether it's mechanics or electromagnetism, thermodynamics or waves, classical physics or quantum mechanics, the ideas of work, energy, and power form the foundation of all that we do in this subject. If someone stopped you on the street and asked you the question, what is physics? What would be your reply? You should have a ready answer, and here is what I hope you would say. Physics is the science of energy and its transformations. With today's lesson, we begin to grapple in earnest with these crucial concepts. We'll see that the pedestrian use of these words, work and energy and power, will not do for our understanding. They will not work because they have a very technical meaning and appreciating what each means and how we apply them in specific numerical situations will prove to be important for future work in this course. These concepts of work, energy, and power lie disguised in many places. Humanity's attempt to exploit nature in the form of various sorts of machines and engines, getting out of nature the maximum amount of output for the minimum amount of input, is what drove natural philosophers and engineers to this field. Some engineers are obsessed with squeezing every bit of energy out of our devices, making them as efficient as possible. We'll come to define efficiency numerically in a coming lesson. As the world population grows and as readily available resources such as oil, wood, coal, and other things that can easily combust shrink, then this obsession overtakes more and more people. Whole societies are willing to commit vast economic resources toward developing more energy-efficient devices. Let me stop waxing philosophically, and let's begin to lay the groundwork for handling these concepts and displaying the kinds of understanding required of you to master these important topics. It begins with some definitions and some important corollaries to those definitions. Numerically, work is defined as the dot product or the scalar product of a force acting through a displacement. Work is a number that tells us something about what an object experiences when a force acts on it and the object moves from one place to another. In a moment, we'll write the equation for work. But let me point out that the number for work is a scalar quantity, which means there is no direction associated with it. Work is just represented by a magnitude, by an amount. But it is composed of a special way of multiplying two vectors, namely force and displacement. Force is a number with both magnitude and direction, and so is displacement. It also has a magnitude and a direction. We put a great big dot between the force and the displacement to indicate this special way that we'll multiply these vectors together, which in calculus is called the dot product or the inner product. So here's what the equation looks like symbolically. Now you'll notice that I'm using the symbol a lowercase d with an arrow over it for displacement, whereas your textbook employs a delta d. You'll see it written both ways in various other physics books, so you should be familiar with both of them. Another way to write the definition of work is like this. Work equals force, with some parallel bars as a subscript, times d. A diagram here would be useful. Now there are all kinds of forces acting on this box that slides through this displacement, but I want to concentrate on the downward apply force indicated by the red arrow, the pushing force. I want you to imagine that this force is constant. That's an important point. Acting at this angle, theta, which is also constant, and it causes the box to move a distance d across the floor. Let's sketch a diagram showing the force and the displacement vectors. Note well, this is not a free body diagram, but it does show how the vectors are related directionally. If you can't see the angle theta in the red diagram is the same as the angle theta up in the diagram with the box, then stop by and see me outside of class and I can show you some tricks for figuring that out. Now I'd like to suggest to you that not all of the force F is effective in causing that box to slide across through that displacement D. The only part of that force that will cause the box to slide along the horizontal surface is the part of the force that's parallel to the horizontal surface, the part that's along the displacement vector. 
There are two components of the force, one parallel to the displacement and the other perpendicular to it. Breaking the force into components, here's what it looks like. Only the parallel part is effective in influencing the motion of the object as it is displaced. So mathematically, when we write the equation for work, only the piece of the force parallel to the displacement vector appears, and that's related to the cosine of the angle. So probably the most useful way to write the work formula, the one that's helpful in calculations, is that work equals the force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. And you will want to commit this equation to memory. Now let me pause here to say that forces can have two types of influences on an object's motion. The forces can do two things to an object. Here's what they are. Number one, a force can cause an object to change its speed. And number two, a force can cause an object to change its direction. Now it may be that the force will do both of these things depending on how the direction of the force is oriented with respect to the object's velocity. If we look at this force and displacement diagram, you'll see that it's the parallel component of the force responsible for changing the speed, whereas the component of the force that's perpendicular to the displacement changes the direction of the object. So the forces acting on an object can influence the object's motion. For the purposes of work calculations, we're only interested in the component of the force that's related to changes in the object's speed, which is the component of the force parallel to the displacement. We'll handle the perpendicular component in a later lesson when we talk about centripetal acceleration. Now let's go back to this diagram of force and examine more closely and see what the parallel component of the force is capable of doing. It turns out that the numerical value of work can have either a positive sign or a negative sign, and whether the work is positive or negative influences what happens to the motion of the object. I've sketched three diagrams. The first, the red one, showing an acute angle between the force and the displacement. Because the cosine of an acute angle is a positive number, then the work, which equals f times d times the cosine of theta, would also be a positive number. This type of force would tend to cause the object to speed up. In the second diagram, the force is perpendicular to the displacement. Since the angle between the force and the displacement is 90 degrees, then the work computed in this case would be equal to zero. There is no component of the force that will change the object's speed. The object would neither speed up nor slow down if such a force were applied. Rather, the object would only change the direction if this force were applied. In the third diagram, there is an obtuse angle between the force and the displacement. That force would produce a negative value for the work, because the cosine of an ob obtuse angle gives a negative value. This force would tend to slow down the object's motion. Ultimately, these values for work will be related to changes in the object's total energy through a physical law known as the work energy theorem. The bottom line is that the relative direction between the force and the displacement will influence the numerical value calculated for this quantity that we're calling work. Well, now what about this? Let's suppose that I apply a force to an object, but the object doesn't move at all. What if there is no displacement of the object when a force is applied to it? Another way of asking this question is this. What is the work done on an object if the displacement is zero? Well, if you put d equals zero into the work equation, then you come up with the work equals the force times zero times the cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement. And anything times zero equals zero. So numerically, the work equals zero. So what this implies is that even if the force is exerted on an object, if the object does not change its position, i.e., if the object doesn't move at all, then there is no work done on the object the force doesn't produce any work on this object. We will encounter situations in which no motion occurs, even when a force is applied. And in those cases, the work done by that force equals zero. Now here's a caveat regarding forces and motion. If any force is exerted perpendicular to the object's motion, such as this case number two in green up here, it does no numerical work on the object either. So, for example, a pendulum that's the end of a string experiences a tension force on the string along the radius of the partial circular path that the pendulum traces out during its swing. 
But that force, the tension force, does no work on the pendulum bob. Certainly the string produces a force on the bob, and certainly the bob moves back and forth along the arc of the circle, but because the displacement is always tangent to the circle, in other words, because the displacement is always normal to the string tension, the string does no work on the pendulum bob. In a much later lesson, we'll see that electrons moving in a magnetic field follow a circular path. We'll find that the magnetic force does no work on the charges in motion in a magnetic field. We'll come to see that the magnetic force is just a weird force. It's unlike any other force that we've ever encountered. And we'll come to see that the direction of the force is given by something known as a right hand rule, which relates the direction of the force, the direction of the magnetic field, and the direction of charge motion. All those vectors are mutually perpendicular and the magnetic force does no work on a moving charged particle. Now let me pause here to make you aware of three important types of right triangles you'll need to know as you proceed through this course. They include a 30-60-90, 45-45-90, and a 3-4-5 right triangle. I bring these up because on the multiple choice section of the AP Physics exam on which you'll not have access to your calculator, you'll be expected to make calculations that involve these special types of triangles. You ought to know the first two from your math classes, and possibly you're not as familiar with the 3-4-5 triangle. It's called a 3-4-5 triangle because 3 squared plus 4 squared is equal to 5 squared from the Pythagorean theorem. You need to know the angles that of this triangle include 37 degrees and 53 degrees. So on the AP physics exams, these angles are going to appear in diagrams. If you see either a 37 or a 53 degree angle, you should immediately think of a 3, 4, 5 triangle. And then you can figure out the components of the vectors involved in the problem based on the trig ratios. So the sine of 37 is equal to 3 fifths, cosine of 37 is equal to 4 fifths, the tangent of 53 is equal to 4 thirds. You should know these cold. Now let's go on to work through a couple of numerical examples involving work, energy, and power. 